And welcome, Destiny Christian Church, and welcome our online audience. We're doing this actually twice today, once in the sanctuary with people and once without people because uh, we couldn't record it today. So here you go. So today we're going to be talking about a new series that I'm starting called uh, Daniel Series, What to Do in a World Gone Crazy. And in particular, part one, what do you feed on in a toxic world? And I felt like in Daniel, there's so much to do and, and there's so much to share today. And I want to try to keep it, you know, short if I can, which is kind of hard when you're introducing a, a whole book, basically. But if you want to understand the book of Daniel, you have to look at who it was written to. It was written to exiles, people that are basically now the minority. Uh, when it was written, it was written at the end of Israel's history of reigning as kings and princes and you know no more did they have a nation anymore and why it was written it was written to encourage exiles people that are struggling and feel like hey i'm under exile i'm kind of uh you know feel lost in this culture i'm in and i feel like a foreigner in, the, in my own culture and so um i've seen some books online for sale you know that say well you know here are the secrets to interpreting daniel and really <sighs> That doesn't go anywhere because you can spend your whole life worrying about what vision meant what and you know what what, what the head meant and what the feet meant and all these things and miss the whole point of the underlying story of Daniel, which is really, really the fact that God rules and reigns. He's sovereign over everything and he can do everything he wants, anything he wants, anytime he wants. That's the underlying story of Daniel. And that's why all these visions are based on God doing these things through history anytime he wants to do it. And so every generation interprets Daniel according to the social and political uh, tone of their times. And in Daniel, we find that there, it's a story after the story. What happened before? Before, in the book of Daniel, came Israel's devastation. The devastation did not happen because of a superpower winning or politics prevailing against Israel. It came because God caused a nation, Nebuchadnezzar, to defeat Israel because God was punishing Israel because of disobedience, basically. And these are consequences. And in Daniel, we find the faithfulness of people and the fruitfulness of people in the land of exile. And, and that's a whole nother lesson there, right? Do you excel when you're in exile? Do you excel when you feel like, like you're a pariah in, in, in the world? We have people like Daniel, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and even the apostles. They all lived and served in foreign places. Because even though they were in Judah at the time, Judah was under, you know, the apostles, Judah was, was under Roman occupation. So there were always these colonized people, and they thrived under it. It's amazing how God does this. So in this six-part series, we are going to focus on... Um, the first six chapters of Daniel, and that's it, because each chapter has a story, and every story has a powerful truth behind it. I'm not going to focus on all the visions and all the things people say they have the keys about, because that just leads to a bunny, a bunny trail, right, that you can never really solve. So these six stories are basically short stories, and someone once said that short stories can be read in an hour, but can be remembered for a lifetime, and that's why it's so important to consider the book of Daniel. So we find that there was encouragement for generations to come in this book. That's why it was, it was revealed as, as part of the canon of Scripture. In fact, did you know that when, when Korea was under Japanese domination, that the Korean Christians read the book of Daniel as a manual on how to live under an evil system? Does that sound familiar today in a sense? There's so much evil in the world. And when you're a believer in the West and in America, really, there's so much evil out there. It seems like everything is reversed. Everything is backwards. Good is wrong. Wrong is right. And everything is crazy. And so how do you live in that kind of world? And in Daniel, we find that we never know where God's path will lead us. In fact, in Daniel 1.6, it says, As it turned out, and I'll say it again, as it turned out, among these young men were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And those three last names, you'll recognize them later with the name change and another story. But in Daniel, we find the principle of divine reversals. In an evil world, just when you think that you're in for it, that everything is over and it's all been written, God overturns things and puts the strong in their place and he puts the weak and he raises up the weak. That, that's what God does because he does it for his glory. But also, I, I want to kind of just spend a few minutes, a few minutes about the significance of Babylon 
and then talk about some responses to, to Babylon. How do we respond to, to a place we call Babylon? Because really, America is modern-day Babylon. That's where everything flows out of. But first, let's talk about what Babylon really is in the scriptures spiritually. Babylon is the center of everything. Babylon means literally the gate of the gods. And did you know that Babylon was the place where the Tower of Babel was built hundreds of years previously? And so Babylon is always known as a center of all these things. It's, it's the cultural, financial, and political center of the world. If Babylon sneezes, the whole world catches cold. It was also the center of trade. It's impossible to trade without Babylon. It was filled with luxury and excess. And also it's the persecutor of God's people. It is also the counterfeit of God's kingdom. In other words, God creates a kingdom that is called his bride. Satan counterfeits with a kingdom that he calls Babylon. And Revelation 17.5 calls Babylon the mother of prostitutes, which leads me to the last feature of Babylon, which is this. It, it is destined to fall. Every Babylon and every generation falls. Every generation has a Babylon. Uh, during Daniel's time, it was Nebuchadnezzar, right? It was, it was the... the uh, you know, the, the kingdom of Babylon. Then later on, it was the Romans, right? And so every generation has Babylon. Today, it's America and the West. And so, however, the bad news is that all Babylons are destined to fall. Rome was the Babylon of its day. And as great as it was, as old as it was, it fell. And Babylon is symbolic of the power, the influence, and the idolatry and wickedness of Rome and of every nation that leads the world. That's why the angel in Revelation 14.8 said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of passion of her sexual immorality. This is kind of scary stuff because when you look at America, America is the leading exporter of, of pornography. And among other things, just the evil that comes out of America is really scary and we must never ignore it. But also, Babylon seeks to reformat your identity. In, in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, But the overseer of the court officials renamed them, meaning Daniel and his friends. He gave Daniel the name Bel 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 Belteshazzar. Hanani, he named Shadrach. Mishael, he named Mesach. And Meshach and Azariah, he named Abednego. And these are kind of, you know, fancy names, and they, they don't like exactly roll off the tongue. But Babylon changes people's names. It seeks to change your identity. That's the point. And to be able to do, to name something is power. And, but also Babylon seeks to change the things that you feed on. That's why we're talking today about what are you feeding on? And in Daniel 1, 7, it says, So the king assigned them a daily ration from his royal delicacies and from the wine that he himself drank. So every day, Babylon has a diet for you. Did you know that? Every, every, every day, Babylon wants you to drink its Kool-Aid. It wants you to feed on it. It wants you to feed on fear, on suspicion, on gossip, on hopelessness, on anger, on lust and greed and hate and left and right and conservative and liberal and CNN and Fox and Newsmax and Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram, TikTok, all these things. You can keep going on and on. And it's one thing to be informed about what's going on in the world, but it's another thing to be consumed by it because you're feeding on it so much that it's warping your personality. We become whatever it is we consume. So with that said, as an, as an introduction to Daniel, here are five responses to Babylon that, that you, can, you can begin today in, in your attitude as you respond to the spirit of the age, which is called Babylon. The first one is this, the choice of, of who you are going to be in Babylon. Did you know that just because you're living in a system that is evil, that every day is getting worse and worse, and you know, all the politics and all the craziness of the past few years has been insane. And you can either be sucked into it and become bitter at it and lash out at it, or you can ask the Holy Spirit, how do you want me to live in this Babylon? How do you want me to respond? How do you want me to be salt and light in this world that is evil? So Daniel 1.8 says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the royal delicacies or the royal wine. He therefore asked the overseer of the court officials for permission not to defile himself. So what's going on here? We know that, you know, Abraham Heschel once said that 
passion cannot be vanquished by decree. And the king decreed, this is what you're going to eat. But the passion for God led Daniel and his friends to say, no, we're not going to do that. And this is the kind of, of stance we need to take in our age, that we don't have to eat all the schlock being shoveled out to us. And this defilement that that the king was doing, because it says Daniel didn't want to be defiled, came in two ways. The change of the name. And let me re re refer to this now. Daniel literally means God is judge, but he was renamed Belteshazzar. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. He was renamed to Shadrach. Mishael, whose name means who is what God is, which I, I don't understand it, but that, that's the, the little interpretation of his name. He was renamed Meshach, and then Azariah was named Abednego, and, and we don't have really have a, uh, a root name for that. But what's the point? That each name was connected, each new name was connected to some Babylonian god. And the spirit of the age always seeks to change your name, to change your identity, to change who you are and how you function. And changing someone's name is a sign of power and of, of authority. Think of Adam, when Adam named the animals, he had power to do that. He had wisdom to do that. So when, tr when someone tries to change your identity and name, it's a powerful thing. But when Jesus marks you as his own, because you have his, you have a new name written down, right? Nobody can take away that name. And you must contend for that name. But let me say this also, that the choice of who you are going to be involves not necessarily rejecting the name Babylon gives you. Because Daniel didn't reject his name Belteshazzar but instead excelling under that name through God's grace. That's the key. That whatever the, the, the world decides to call you, you excel and flourish and bear fruit under that name to show forth the name of Jesus and his power in the world. That's the whole point of this. So one way of defilement was change of name. The other way was change of diet. And we find that between the Old and the New Testaments, it's called the inter intertestamental period. There was a, 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 a story in the, in the Maccabees, which are extra biblical books, and Antiochus was kind of like an emperor, and he was as evil as they come. And he had tried to force the then Jews to eat pork or die, because he was trying to, he knew that if, if he got them to eat pork, he would change their identity. And, and for a Jew, pork is the most abominable thing you can eat. It's unclean, it's, it's unhealthy, it's evil. But here's the second response, right? The, besides choosing who you're going to be in Babylon, here's, here's response number two, the, the determination of what you take into your spirit. In other words, what you feed on in Babylon. We, we mentioned some of those things that we can feed on, right? All that media and stuff. And just the message that the world always pushes on you. The world always wants you to drink their Kool-Aid. So what we eat and drink are an outward appearance or, or expression, rather, of inner identity. And that's why it's so important that what you feed on is healthy and that it feeds your spirit. So are we feeding on the food and the wine and the delicacies that the modern emperors are offering us? Or are we feeding on Jesus and what he wants us to feed on? Do you feed on Babylon's toxic bread or on the bread of life, Jesus? And why was this diet so important? Why was, why was Daniel so defiled in, in, in his feelings towards this food? Well, it's a fact that the king's food would, would in fact defile them because most of the king's food likely came from idol worship. The people would come and worship with their idols and bring food as an offering. And then after they were done, the food was taken right to the king's table as the first portion. So Daniel said, I'm not eating that stuff. That's offered to, de to demons because in the scriptures, we know that idols are considered demons, right? Because only there's only one God. And so Daniel's like, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. So so th that's the beauty of this, that he, he, he decided he was not going to feed on the spirit of Babylon. But here's number three, response number three, a willingness to put your faith on the line. How do you know you're really a Christian if, if you're not tested? Daniel 1.12, Daniel told the steward, please test your servants for 10 days by providing us with some vegetables to eat and water to drink. And 
because this is a whole long chapter of 49 verses, I'm only kind of referring to scriptures here and there. But basically, Daniel is saying, look, test us. We're not going to eat that food, but test us to see how we look after 10 days and if we're healthier and if we're doing better. And if not, then, then you can deal with us accordingly. Fruitfulness. So we, we find that God was looking for fruitfulness in Daniel. And that fruitfulness was putting his faith on the line, which lead, leads us to the, the fourth response to Babylon. Fruitfulness that doesn't come from Babylon. What do I mean by that? Again, the Babylonian system wants you to, to so rely on it and so, so lean on it that everything you have depends on it so that if the system collapse, collapses, you collapse. And, but God has a way of, of blessing his children in exile to the point where they can be fruitful to the point that none of their energy and fruit and power came from Babylon. That's why Daniel in one thirteen says, compare, then compare our appearance with that of the young men who are eating the royal delicacies. Deal with us in light of what you see. It was a challenge. He was saying, you watch. After 10 days, you watch the fruit that we bear in this world that has nothing to do with, with your system. Watch our God, how he works. So a sign that Daniel's fast worked was at the end of 10 days, they were all more plump. They looked healthy. Their eyes were bright. And the steward was impressed. He's like, wow. And thus, the glory of God was shown in the land of Babylon. That's why Psalms 121.12 says, My help comes from the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. So does the world see your fruitfulness as a follower of Jesus? Or do they see a mean response to the Babylonian system? I feel like too many Christians have gotten just really nasty and mean against the government. And we know that there's evil there. Absolutely. We should pray for our government. But we should always respect as we pray. Never dishonor but always honor because God put them there, believe it or not. And either God is all powerful or he's not. In this series, we're going to see that, that the whole story behind Daniel is that God is sovereign. God is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he can do whatever he wants and whatever he wants. And so if there's an evil emperor at the time we're living, it's because God let him, let him go there. And we don't have the power we think we do without the power of God. So number five, response to Babylon. A resolve to engage Babylon redemptively. What do I mean by that? It says in Daniel 1.15, at the end of the 10 days, their appearance was better than their, and their bodies healthier than all the young men who had been eating the royal delicacies. So they proved God's point. They, they, they showed that they can turn things around that were negative and make them redemptive because God shows up in that moment. And so our job is not to hide and wait for the return of Jesus in our evil world. Our, our, our job is to be fruitful in our world and, and show by the way we live and show by the fruits of our lives, the power of God and, and the fruit of Jesus in our lives. It doesn't mean we don't care about the evil. It doesn't mean we don't get upset about the evil, but it means that our focus is to flourish in the land God put us no matter what. So they were involved with the gifting God gave them right where they were. But here's number six, and we're going to kind of bring this in for a little landing here. The sixth response to Babylon is this, the use of your gifts that bring favor with the king. And what do I mean by that? You know, dictators like Nebuchadnezzar were moody, they were volatile, they were hard to please, and thought nothing of cutting off people's heads if displeased. And Daniel 1.19 shows the reaction of how, how everything was just reversed at the end. It was amazing of what happened with the king. When the king spoke with them, he did not find among the entire group anyone like, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Do you see that? There was no one like them. They were distinguished in a culture of evil. It says, in, in every matter of wisdom and insight, the king asked about them. He found them ten times better than any of the, the magicians, the, the astrologers. And so, do you see what's happening there? 
that God has called us to flourish in our land and to, to show forth the testimony of Jesus in our lives. That's, that's the point of, of this first chapter of Daniel. So let me introduce you to Daniel in this series. And, and next week, we're going to be talking about Daniel again and, uh, and what it means to, to bring a word of hope in a confused world because Daniel was given this dilemma of interpreting the king's dream. So make sure you check out our, our church website, destinychristianniagara.com. Check out our podcast by Lori Miller, My Sheep Know My Voice. And it's on Facebook and YouTube. And just connect with us. And and uh, and if you want to sow into this ministry, there'll be a barcode at the end. You can you can scan if you want. Uh, we're, we're blessed to be able to do this. So I'm so glad to be with you. Until next time, God bless you.